Okay, so uh, thanks to the cooking crew today, which is Bill, Dan, and Craig. And we asked for a $6 donation to cover food costs. Next month, at this same time and location, Jonathan Daisy will be at the other end of the camera talking about his trip to Taiwan. So today we have Amy Metzler. And she is part of the uh, Grow Native Massachusetts and the something pollinator. Massachusetts Network. Pollinator Network. And also Elders Climate Action. I'm on the research team and the Natural Solutions Working Group. Great. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to be talking about um, why it's really important to garden and landscape with native plants. Um, they're really important for keeping an ecosystem healthy, and how to do it. I'm going to cover the biodiversity crisis, which gets a lot less attention than the climate crisis, but it's really just as serious an environmental issue. Um, and I have a section where I'm talking about how native plants and trees co-evolved with insects and birds, so they depend on each other for survival. And I'm going to talk about how to garden to support biodiversity, and then I have resource slides, and actually, I forgot to ask Jeff about this ahead of time, but um, I really like to make those available to people. So when I'm done, you can either take my email address and ask me to send them to you, or maybe there's a place to post them in a newsletter or something. Anyway, we'll figure that out. Um, so this is a picture of Mars, and we don't want Earth to end up like this. Um, all the latest reports from the UN climate scientists and the biodiversity reports are saying that climate change and biodiversity loss are equally threatening to ecosystem and human existence. And at this point, there's a million animal and plant species that are declining in numbers and are at risk of extinction. And many of these are within decades. And I started looking at this a couple years ago, and the reports are just getting more and more urgent. Um, and if these crises are not dealt with together, they'll both get worse. I think of the analogy of if you had two life-threatening <laughs> health conditions like cancer and cardiac, and you just decided to treat one, you're not going to survive. And that's sort of where we are on our planet at this point. So some information about the decline in species. Um, in North America, we've lost almost a third of the bird population in 50 years. And a big reason for this is um, birds are losing a major source of food, which is insects. There's 41% of insects that are declining in numbers and are facing extinction globally. They're falling at such a rapid rate that they could be gone by the end of the century, which really would be catastrophic. I'll explain how important insects are for really all ecosystem function. Um, in Massachusetts, there's 400 native bee species, and this doesn't include honeybees. They're actually not native, and they're not at risk, and they're not important for supporting um, other local species. But it's not too late to do something about this. This is a picture of the great northern bumblebee, which is declining in numbers in Massachusetts. But there's um, researchers who are showing us which plants these insects need for survival. And if we plant them, we can reverse the decline. So here's some of the reasons why insects are so important. Um, they pollinate many of our food crops. They pollinate 90% of flowering plants, which means the plants are depending on them for reproduction. They're food for many other species. You can see a bird here feeding an insect to its young. But there's also uh, the species that eat insects also get eaten by other species, so they're kind of a really important part of the food web. Um, there are insects in soil that help sequester carbon in soil, so without them the climate crisis would get worse. And I just recently saw a report that there's over an estimate that over 400,000 people around the world are dying annually because there's such a decline in pollinators, there's less produce being um, harvested, and that's having an impact on people's health. So there are a number of causes of insect decline, um, but the 
The major one is habitat loss. And you can see, here's a big agricultural field that's growing one crop. It's usually soaked in pesticides. So there's really, insects are either actively being killed or there's nothing there for them to eat. Um, deforestation is another source of loss of habitat. Um, urbanization, you can see, you know, I mean, it is possible to do a lot in cities to support different species, but if you don't have trees and native trees and plants, then um, they, again, don't have anything to eat. And another contributing factor is just that we use so many plants from other ecosystems and other continents, and non-native plants, which I'll explain in detail, don't provide the support that's needed to keep native insects going. Um, either they're not providing the food for adults, or often they're not providing the food for the next generation, which we don't generally think about as much. So pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers all either damage insects directly or the habitat that they depend on. Invasive plants and insects also damage um, habitat. Light pollution, I'll talk about a little bit more, but that disrupts insect um, life cycles. And of course, climate change is having an effect. It has a bigger effect in the tropics than in temperate zones. But obviously, for having huge floods and wildfires and you know searing heat, that's not helpful. So in this section, I'm going to talk about um, kind of the evolutionary relationships among native plants, insects, birds. And actually, I took out fungi because I actually have less time to talk here than I normally do. That's another part of just how different species depend on each other. But I'm not going to go into that today. So first, some definitions. Um, native plants are plants in a given region that co-evolve with other species, and they provide many benefits. There's some controversy over you know, what defines native. Like, is it OK to get plants from the Midwest or from south of us, or should it just be in New England? So you know, people make different decisions about that. But generally, it's the co-evolution that's important, that they're actually providing, the plants are providing support for other local species. Non-native plants um, were imported from other, I have a picture here of Siberian iris, which I think is beautiful, and I used to have it in my garden, but it's actually, in terms of supporting local species, sterile. It's like having a pretty picture hanging on your wall. So plants that were brought here from other eco-regions or other continents are non-native plants. And even the ones that have been here for hundreds of years that were brought here by the colonists a long time ago, Evolution doesn't happen fast enough for them to be able to provide the support that native species do. I'm going to talk about that a little more, too. And then I'm sure you've all heard about invasive plants, which, you know, the ones in this picture can actually take down trees. Um, they're plants from other regions that grow really aggressively, and they crowd out other species. Some of them actually exude a chemical from their roots, which poisons the plants around them and allows them to keep spreading. So that's a big problem. And there are different ways of dealing with that. So how did insects and native plants become interdependent? They've been co-evolving for 125 million years. And the result of that is that plants depend on insects to pollinate them so they can reproduce. Insects depends on, depend on plants for food, both the adult um, stage of life and also their offspring. And their offspring eat different things than the adults. I'm going to talk about that, too. And then plants defend themselves against being eaten excessively by insects by producing toxic chemicals that either are unpalatable or poisonous to insects. And in response to that, insects have evolved. They produce um, enzymes that allow them to bypass the toxicity, but they've only done that for very specific plants. They, don't, they haven't evolved so they can feed on all plants. They can only use certain plants. And the result of this is that they've developed very specialized relationships. So the vast majority of insects need specific plants for food and can't survive without them. And most plants can only be pollinated by limited numbers of insects. So they've evolved symbiotic chemical and physical traits, and I'm going to show you a few examples of those. And this, you know, obviously has taken eons. And so, as I mentioned earlier, 
plants that are brought here from other ecoregions, and even many of the plants that have been hybridized don't provide the benefit to insects that um, the native plants do that evolved with them. And people have said to me, you know, well, why can't insects feed on plants that have been here for 400 years? And the best analogy I've heard for that is, um, you know, imagine, you know, maybe you're someone who loves to hike and you go out in the woods and you get lost and you run out of food. It would be really convenient if you could eat twigs, right? If we could digest wood, we could live out in the woods for ages. And we haven't evolved to be able to do that. It's as difficult for an insect to evolve to be able to eat a species that they didn't develop with as it is for us to eat wood. So here's one example of a specialized relationship. There are, these are Monarda plants or bee balm. They um, grow very long, thin, tubular flowers, and there are many other plants that do the same thing. And there are insects that have evolved to have very long tongues. So it's the long-tongued insects and also hummingbirds with their long beaks that can pollinate long tubular flowers. And there are short-tongued insects that just can't pollinate a plant like this. And let's see if I can get this little video to go. So there are plants that have very thick closed um, petals. This blue gentian here that the bumblebee is forcing its way into is actually a closed flower. And only bumblebees are strong enough to get into plants like that. I actually have many family members who now send me pictures of flowers with little bee bottoms sticking out of them. It's, it's a lot of fun. So here's another example. This is a, a, a chemical relationship. So we've all heard about monarch butterflies and how they're endangered. And so the specialized relationship that monarchs have with milkweed is the adult butterflies can actually get nectar from many different flowers. But the caterpillars can only eat milkweed plants. So you might have a garden full of monarch butterflies, but if you don't have milkweed, it can't reproduce. So here's a picture of a monarch egg on a milkweed plant, and then there's a picture of a caterpillar. And it's very exciting to grow milkweed and see these caterpillars developing on them. Just get a sip. So I'm going to talk about why hybridized plants aren't very useful. I mean, some of them really are, but a lot of them aren't. And if you're planting to support biodiversity, the safest thing is to buy the original species of the native plant. Um, the cultivars and the hybridized versions will have a, a name after it, the Latin name in quotes. That's your clue. Um, so the native species provide nectar for adult insects. They provide pollen and leaves for the next generation. They develop seeds that birds can eat. So you can see, I'm using an echinacea plant as an example here. On the upper left, you can see all these different butterflies on the echinacea. On the right, there's a goldfinch eating seeds in the fall. And because they're open pollinated, there's genetic variability. And that's really important, especially now during this time of climate change where we have you know, repeated adverse events if you have genetic variability in a plant population, there might be one that can handle drought better than another or that can handle heat better than another, so it can survive. And if you have a bunch of cloned plants, which are the hybridized ones that you can see on the bottom, they're all the same. They're all from the original plant, and there's no variability. And then they're much more susceptible to getting wiped out. Um, so these echinacea plants on the bottom have been highly hybridized just for their visual effect. So they've ended up with no pollen and no nectar. They don't uh, produce seeds, and there's no genetic variation. So again, there's some hybridized plants that are still ecologically useful, um, but it's good to do the research to find out which ones those are, again, if you're planting for biodiversity. I'm not saying never plant something that looks like this. You know, if there's some plant you love and it doesn't provide ecosystem support, that's fine, but again, if you're trying to kind of help us survive the biodiversity crisis we're in, planting the straight natives is, is the most helpful. So here's um, 
a chart from a Doug Tallamy book. He is a really important groundbreaking researcher on the relationship between native plants and insects. I'm not going to go through this whole chart, but all the plants on the far left are from other continents. The next column shows how many species they supported in their home range where you know, they're a native plant, where they came from. So that ranges from 40 to 400 species. The next column, and here they are in North America where they're not a native plant. They're only supporting zero to eight species. And then on the far right, this is how long they've been here, between 100 and 300 years. So they're just, plants are much more useful where they evolved. And then here's an example with trees. Um, people plant lots of ginkgo trees. They're hardy. You know, the leaves are beautiful. They've been here well over 200 years, and they support one species here. And oak trees, which is the plant I mentioned when we were in the circle, they support over 500 species of insects, birds, and mammals, and over 400 of those are insects. So on average, native plants support 13 times more insect species than non-natives and non-native plants support zero to five. So here's something that's important to know is that um, when we're planting, we need to not just think about feeding adults. So generally it's the flowers that we're aware of when we're planting pollinator gardens that provide nectar for adults. But the next generation of moths and butterflies and bees and other insects eat different food. So the process for moths and butterflies is that they lay their eggs on leaves. When the eggs hatch, the caterpillars eat the leaves, and they're specialized to only be able to eat particular plants. And this is an example. This is a spicebush butterfly, and that's the very adorable spicebush caterpillar. And it's on a spicebush plant because that caterpillar can only <laughs> eat leaves from that bush. Then there's a similar story with bees. Um, bees collect pollen from plants to store in their nests. And again, most of us are used to thinking about honeybees that live in these big hives. Most native bees are solitary and they make little tunnels in the ground or in um, wood and they uh, create pollen balls and store them in their nests and lay their eggs next to it. And when the eggs hatch, they can eat the pollen but again, they can only eat pollen from very particular plants. So again, if you don't have those native plants, you might have bees collecting nectar in your garden, but they're not able to collect food for the next generation. So those are called host plants, the ones that provide food for the, the next generation of insects. So what this means is I had to get used to this because I used to just garden for visual beauty. Now I garden for ecosystem support is that you're gonna have, if you have the right plants in your garden and you're supporting caterpillar, you know, moths and butterflies, there are gonna be caterpillars eating little holes in the leaves. And, you know, I think most of us were thought, taught to think, oh no, we have pests in the garden, you know, it's not perfect looking anymore. But actually, I'm really excited when I see this now because I know that the next generation is gonna grow up and become a moth or a butterfly. And so this is from a birch tree and up close, you see holes, and you stand back. The tree is perfectly healthy. It's not hurting the tree. They all evolved to have this interdependent relationship. So Desiree Narango was a student of Doug Tallamy, who I mentioned earlier, and she did some really interesting research that showed that one nest of chickadees eats six to 9,000 caterpillars, which I just think is incredible. And if there weren't enough woody native plants in the area, there weren't enough caterpillars for the birds to feed their young. And these are little tiny <laughs> birds, and that's how many they eat. So she found if there was, you know, 94 to 100% native woody plants, there were enough caterpillars. When it dropped below 70%, the birds actually started to die. There just wasn't enough food for them. So people are kind of using this as a rule of thumb that if you want to have a healthy, thriving ecosystem, you need at least 70% native plant biomass. So when I first heard 70%, I was kind of counting my plants and seeing, did I have 70%? But it's the mass of um, biomaterial in the garden. So for instance, an oak tree has a lot more native plant material available than you know, one monarda plant. 
So you're looking at the, the mass of material. Um, keystone plants, so not all native plants are um, equally helpful in a landscape or a garden. There are about 5% of native plants that feed 75% of insects. So these are called keystone plants. And there are two kinds. They're the plants that feed the caterpillars of butterflies and moths, and the plants that feed the specialist bees who can only eat pollen from certain plants. So there, um, I actually have a slide uh, which is in the resource slide packet that I'll make available to everyone that shows you what the keystone plants are in our area. Um, so if you're starting out growing native plants, it's great to start with those because you'll support the most species. But it's also really helpful to plant many other kinds of plants. For instance, the, um, the native lupine plant supports the blue carner butterfly. So it's just one species, but the butterfly can't survive on anything else. So the more diversity you have, the more help you're providing all these species. So this is, again, just because I don't have that much time, this will be in the resource packet. So if anyone wants it, you can see these lists of the keystone plants. And then there's another link to a place where you'll get a really comprehensive list. So now I'm going to talk a little about how to actually do this. So I mentioned at the beginning that one of the major reasons why we're losing insects is because we don't have enough habitat for them. And um, so that's really a main thing to address. We don't have enough wild habitat left where we're outside of where we live in order to support all these species. There's 40 million acres in the US that are in lawns, which is equal to the acreage of the continental national parks. And in Massachusetts, 20% of our land is in lawns. And they are ecosystem deserts. If you look at this picture on the left, it's short. It's a monoculture. They have very short um, roots. There's no flowers. And people often use a lot of pesticides. So there's really nothing there for insects. And then here on the right, this is just a little strip next to a street, but it's so full of flowering plants. It's going to support lots of adult insects. It'll have seeds for birds. Um, so here's um, Doug Tallamy, again, the entomologist that I talked about earlier, um, has started a website and kind of a movement called Homegrown National Park. And he's recommending that we, if we all planted half of our lawns with 70% native habitat, we could really reverse the biodiversity crisis. So he's recommending, um, I mean, either you can do half your lawn or you can just think about what do I actually need for grass? Where are the kids playing? Where are we walking? And you can turn the rest of it into habitat. So this is actually a picture from, I'm not sure which town it is, but it's not far from here. And this all used to be lawn in front of this house. And then the homeowner has put in lots of trees and shrubs and flowering plants and grasses. And you know, this is a big project. It's expensive and it's a lot of space and not everyone can do this. So you can start much smaller than that. Um, there are just many ways to get started. Even a window box of native plants is helpful. But um, so the way to get started is there's similar things to it to growing any kind of garden. You know, you want to know what are your light conditions. Is it sunny? Is it shady? Is the soil moist? Is it dry? And then there are many ways to either add native plants to an existing bed. You can start a new garden bed. You can make use of your lawn, as I was just saying. There are also ways to make the lawn more life-supporting, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And then you want to plant in layers like you see in nature, in woods or in meadows, that there's ground covers, there's taller plants, there's shrubs and trees. And then you want to be checking for invasives and taking them out. So the overall goals for a native garden are to have flowers blooming from early spring into the fall. And some of the non-native bulbs actually provide support to insects, and they're some of the first things to come up. So insects are emerging at various times, all during the growing season. And they also 
need pollen at different times because they're nesting at different times. So that's why having a long bloom season is really helpful. If you can plant in groups, it makes it easier for the insects to forage because they have a lot of the food they need right in one spot. Um, here's the link to the keystone plants, which I'll give you. Again, growing 70% native biomass. And then Rob Gajir is an insect researcher from UMass who um, has a big plant list for which plants are needed by the insects that are most at risk in Massachusetts. And I've actually turned that into a spreadsheet with lots of information to help you decide, is it blooming at the right time? Is it the right height? Whatever. Um, so you'll have access to that too. That's a great place to start choosing plants. And then um, there's important things that are different from, again, from how most of us were taught to garden to help support insects through their life cycle in terms of how we take care of our gardens. So the best thing is don't clean it up in the fall. There are insects that nest in the stems of plants that are standing. There are seeds left on the plants that birds will take during the winter. If you leave leaves on the ground, you know, you don't want to rot your lawn, but in other places, um, they're insects that overwinter in the leaves. And if they're places where you need to clean things up, you can, if you have room, put them off on the side so that the insects can continue to use them even if they're not in your garden bed. Um, you can, in the spring when it starts to warm up, you can cut the stalks to about this high because there'll still be insects in there. Again, if you can put the stalks off to the side, they'll continue to emerge and they'll eventually they'll become compost that's really useful. And all the things that you see in nature that are just lying around, rocks, tree trunks that are dead, you know, piles of branches, those all provide really important shelter. So if we can learn not to clean up our gardens, we're really helping all these species survive through the winter. And I found that it's beautiful. I mean, the stems are different colors. They, they have different shape pods on top. It looks sculptural to me. And then the snow falls on it and it has a whole other look. So I think it's gorgeous. If you're in a place where your neighbors are going to think you're just a lazy slob, then there are things you can do. You can put up a sign saying it's pollinator habitat. You can make the edges tidy. I'm in Cambridge and I have a sidewalk next to part of my garden. So in the front, I kind of make it look a little more traditional. I'm still using native plants. And in the back, where I'm not trying to convince people to grow native plants, you'll have a beautiful garden. I let things get a little wilder looking. Um, so you can manage it so that your neighbors aren't upset with you, hopefully. Um, you want to provide, you know, I'm a little worried about my time. So I'm going to skip through some of these things. I do have a summary slide about what to do to have an eco-friendly garden. And these will be on here, but I'm going to skip the light and water part. Um, in terms of lawns, I think this is really helpful. We're in an area where people do have lawns. If you mow less frequently, let the grass get taller, leave the grass clippings, they become fertilizer, avoid all chemical use, and then let little flowers come up and grow in the lawn. And insects will come feed on the flowers. You'll have birds coming and pecking around, looking for insects to eat. It's really thrilling to see that transformation happen and to see the life that starts coming to your property when you have all these life-supporting plants growing there. Again, this will be in the resource. These are a list of um, plants that you can leave in your lawn that are helpful. Um, I'm going to skip this one too. I think we all know chemicals kill things and it's best to avoid them. This is a little more detail about that. Um, so this, these sites are really helpful to me when I'm either in my own garden or helping other people plant. Um, these are places that I go to help choose plants. So the Native Plant Trust, which is a really wonderful place to go to buy plants. That's another thing to do is just go to a native plant nursery and talk to them about what you're looking for and they'll give you a lot of help. But they have a plant finder function on their website where you can put in the variables you're looking for. 
Prairie Moon Nursery has wonderful detailed information about how to grow plants and what they look like. Um, so these are all really helpful sites, and I'll give you access to this page too. Um, you can, I, I'm a little worried about time, so I'm going to skip through a few things. I'm going to give you this summary of garden practices, and I've basically talked about all of it, but it's a good reference to have. And then biodiversity and climate change, there are things we can do for both. And one thing that's a lot on my mind is that fortunately, we're, people are really taking action on climate change, and there's money coming to the states to address climate change. And one way to deal with climate change is to plant trees and also support um, natural habitat. But if you're not planting native trees, you're not dealing with the biodiversity crisis. So I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done about this so that when we're planting trees to sequester carbon, which is really important, we're also planting the trees that are going to support the species in our area that are otherwise likely to go extinct. So supporting legislation that does that is really important or encouraging people in your town, whatever you can do to encourage the um, planting of native trees and other plants. Another thing that gardeners need to know is that um, peat bogs store a lot of carbon, and when we disturb them, we're releasing it into the atmosphere. So use the leaves that you have in your yard or that your neighbors have as mulch, and we should stop using peat moss because that's going to uh, contribute to climate change. And again, once you start doing this, it's really thrilling to see the wildlife that comes to your yard. Um, so it's really fun. So these are more resources, um, plant lists and where to get them. I have a spreadsheet of native plant nurseries, and these are all local organizations and websites that are helpful, books you can turn to. I'll make sure everyone has access to all of these if you want them. And then this is a quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who uh, was raised in Native American traditions and also studied environmental biology and is a professor. Um, so she has the best of both traditions. In some native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. And now plants need us to take care of them too. So I'm going to go back to my first slide. So if you want to get the resource slides, you can get my email address, and I'd be happy to send it to you. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.